Hello, everyone. My name is Christian Roberts. I'm the Director of Education at the Dallas Opera, and I'm here with my fabulous co-host, Ms. Quo Johnson, Education and Company Culture Manager for the Dallas Opera. And we are back this week with Episode 5 of Taking the Stage with Christian. And Quo. And today we have a very fabulous guest who really, well, in my opinion, really needs no introduction. Sir, <laughs> would you want to tell us who you are? My name is Morris Robinson. I'm a bass, and Dallas Opera is one of my favorite places to perform. So yeah, <laughs> listen to that speaking voice. Oh, please. oh, it's amazing. <laughs> so Morris is here today because we want to talk about we want to talk about different perspectives, um, and we have been doing uh, talks on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, we have been talking about representation in the arts. Um, last week we had uh, David Lamelli on the show and he kind of set some things up for us as well and Quo, you want to give us a little bit of a recap before we go we dive in with morris absolutely i'm the kind of recap episode <laughs> guru, i guess um so when we spoke with david we talked about kind of experiences in the administrative side as well as being a performer and looked at the importance of making sure that when we seek diversity that we're doing so in a way that is truthful in a way that is sincere and in a way that does not become performative and in a way that does not become what we call the checkbox mentality where we're just simply getting people to come and be so we can say we have diverse casts but being mindful that in order for us to tell stories properly we do have to consider color Right? There's no such thing as colorblind casting. You do have to consider color because it is a part of an identity and it is not a negative part of an identity, but being mindful and being truthful and being bold in what we're doing in a way that makes sense is what will allow us to better connect with other communities and then to better <laughs> perform for ourselves and then to share that performance and that creation of the art with others. So that's what we talked about with David. Thank you so much, Carl, and we thank you all for tuning in today as well. Um, now, Morris, this is a subject that you and I have had conversations about. We have shared experiences. I've heard you talk on this. Um, can you talk about a little bit of your, your experiences um, with representation in opera and with um, being a person of color in the field? Um, I know a lot of times we don't like to concentrate on that and we, we like to let our art speak for ourselves. And I know Mary Anderson was very much um, an advocate of that and letting the, the, her work speak for itself. Um, and I'm all about that. But we all know, also know that there are some realities that we do have to deal with sometimes um, in this field and particularly in, in a European art form. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you've experienced with being in the space and, you know, hiring practices and such? Well, I, you know, I've, I've had lots of interaction and conversations about this type of thing. Uh, most recently, I've kind of aligned myself with the ideology that uh, um, the opera world is a microcosm of the real world. And uh, because of such, the numbers will be skewed. But the reality is, if you compare the numbers of people that study the art form, that love the art form, that want to be a participant on stage and other matters, the numbers are very skewed. Uh, they aren't aligned appropriately. Um, you know, my experience has been very, very fortunate. I'm a base, so I've not been, I won't, I can't tell you what I've not gotten because I'm, a, because I'm black, but I certainly think that the, the aesthetic quality of what I bring to the table isn't as detrimental to one's psyche if I were playing a lead tenor role. I will say that uh, in this space, I've experienced lots of different things. I mean, uh, from, uh, I think that the, the disbelief that someone that looks like me can actually be in this art form has been really, really shocking in some of those experiences. We can talk about the details of those later, but I think in general, um, I said something recently, I've never been conducted by a, an African-American. I've never been directed by an African-American. I've never been hired by an African American in this business, and I've never been—I've uh, never had a, a director African American. It was in 20 years of being on every major stage in our country, in every major orchestra, I've never had any of those experiences. And in order to effectively change our product representation to 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 uh, 
looks similar to that of the, the public that we serve, we have to start with administration. We have to start with putting people in place, not necessarily someone that looks like me, but someone that can think outside the box like David Abilo Malik and say, this works because this person sings it really well. You know, the idea of colorblind casting is kind of controversial to me because, you know, I'm a, I'm a sports guy, right? I came from a, a football background and I always compare these two things that those two worlds should be ones that where all fairness works and the most talented people are the ones that are chosen. And if you played football with me and you can make the play on third and long, I don't care if you were orange. You're going to be our orange defensive end playing next to my black butt, playing next to his white butt. We're going to get this job done. So if we're going to cast Aida, historically, you know, Aida has been a role that black sopranos have been able to go with and be awarded without having to deal with the psychology of the aesthetic quality. But, you know, I don't remember a black Rodimus from way back in the day. You know, mm. we're talking about the battle between Ethiopia and Egypt. Well, last time I checked, both of those are on the continent of Africa. Africa. Huh. So don't come at me with that part. You know, just come at me with the people. I feel that you should just, I've heard that it isn't a talent show, but it should be a talent show. Hire the best singers for the job, the best singers that blend well together, and that will fix a lot of the problems. But I don't know that, if, I don't know that anyone is, proven yet that they have the, the ability to do that without taking into the aesthetic quality. So that I think is the, the, the beginning of the problem, but also the beginning of the solution. I hope that's the answer to what you're asking. So. No, that's exactly what I was looking for because, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I, as a singer myself and as somebody who works in the world of education and Quo can attest to this too, you know, we work with, 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 we see students from every walk of life. You know, we sing, we, 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 have, we have our cast go out to every type of school everywhere. And so when we talk about that representation, you know, I, I've had you go to, go to schools with me whenever you're in town. Of course, and yeah. the, the, the look on people's faces when you walk in the room and you speak with such authority, it's not just the black kids who are standing there in awe. It's every kid. And we talk about, Equo and I talk about all the time, how it's not just important for the Black kids to see a Black person on the stage doing something. It's important for every kid who has never seen that before to see somebody on stage who doesn't look like them working with somebody who may look like them. So we also have to think about what we're representing to our youth and to not just our adult audience, but to our youth. And so, so Quo, can you speak a little bit about that from the from the EDI perspective? Because I always have you weigh on, weigh in on on this uh, part of it as well. Can you weigh in on some of what Morris what Morris has talked about being his experience in this? Absolutely. And then I want to lift up and affirm everything that you said, Morris, because it's the truth. <laughs> in right in simplicity, right? It should be the those who are the best singers or those who are the best performers. You're the best at it. You go out there and you do it. Um, and as we look at that, we have to be mindful of those who are being represented as the best. Not everyone has had the same opportunity to get there. And so that's where kind of that equity comes in and then being mindful of that as we have this pool of the best, you know, how hard did certain people have to fight? How hard did you have to fight? How hard did others have to fight just to break in when others have had advantage? And so I believe you said that, you know, it could be the problem and it's also the solution. And I agree. It's a matter of as we look for the best, we also help support the best. Right. We go out and we seek that talent so that they can become <clears throat> contenders with the best so that they can be in that pool of the best. And then it's important that as we do that, and of course, as again, kids who look like us, kids who don't look like us, see us, they see the difference and then they see the similarities. And then suddenly the differences don't make a difference. Right. The differences are not as important as the similarities. And oh, of course she can do that. Of course he's singing it. Of course he's in that role. Of course they're representing the opera. Of course they're in this art form because it's something that they get used to seeing because we break down those barriers of advantage that allow others to believe that they are more capable, right? <laughs> or that they're just better. They just happen to be working harder than others. So I believe and that as we look at that and as we look at equity and what that means, then we'll get where we need to go. 
and then that which is viewed as an anomaly becomes the new norm, right? Yes, sir. It's like Hegel's dialectics. You know, you have a thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. You know, you have a thesis and an antithesis, which is the involvement in the, the diversity that they see, and then it becomes a new set. That becomes the new the new norm, and that's what you're looking for. Um, and opportunity, you talk about that. You know, I think it's great for young black kids to see people like myself, but I think it's also great for young white kids to see people like myself. That way, that which is the norm is already made up in their minds that this is this is okay, this is normal, this this isn't uh, an anomaly as we have grown to know it to be. It becomes the new norm. Um, so I think that's important. We, you also mentioned about having opportunity to develop. You know, uh, I work with Opera America. I'm working with lots of other people to try and introduce a higher level of representation, a higher level of interaction with certain communities that I think are underserviced by our art form. Um, you're an alumnus of Prairie View Art, are you not? If I'm not yes, mistaken. I am. Can and my dear, no dear, 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 uh, dear, 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 dear friend, Jamie Kamat, Dr. Jamie Kamat just took on a professorship there, and you know her too, Kristen, and uh, has already had people like uh, Jamie Barton go down and do master classes. Mm -hmm. It's already had some of her singers singing at Lincoln Center. She has singers singing uh, in the Mostly Mozart Festival. One of her girls was a finalist for the for the uh, Metropolitan Opera. Uh, and and her, she has this big effort to try to make sure that she utilizes those types of connections to connect with patterning her program after the programs that she went through at UNT and SMU, making sure that that type of, that level of access, that level of development, is it just for certain demographics or certain types of institutions? And I think that that's important too, mm -hmm. uh, so that when one gets an opportunity to present themselves as a candidate for a higher level program, they're not walking into a completely different situation than that which they've been exposed to because they've already been exposed to the highest level. So I think that's important too. And it, it yeah. involves people like myself and, and other black singers reaching back and reaching out into these these programs and these environments and making ourselves available and showing them how it's done. So that's very important too. I just want to add that on to it. No, that actually went straight to my next point of, because what we talked about is how to, how to connect with others and how to, mm -hmm. to link up and what we do to, to, like you said, reach out and reach back. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of, you kind of um, already covered that a little bit, but as far as it, um, you know, I know you you just said that you have worked with Opera America. I know you have served serve as advisor for um, companies as well, uh, artistic advisor and, and that sort of thing. And I know that some of your uh, work in the community has reflected that um, and reflected that what the very thing that you're talking about right now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that has, I mean, what sort of results that you've seen out of that for, for example, like I know your work with like Cincinnati. Um, can you see, can you tell us some of the things that has happened out of that? Yeah, so I can go back a little bit further for, for and I, I say this so that anyone else that's watching that are my contemporaries or people that are in, in the business with me can understand that you don't have to be the artistic advisor of Cincinnati Opera or the artist in resident of the Atlanta Symphony or Harvard University or Boston University to to have the effect of change. You know, I was singing a gig in Washington, D.C., and I was the bass soloist with the Orchestra of St. Luke's to the choir it just so happened to be um, Morgan State University's choir, okay? Uh, in that rehearsal, a young man came up to me with a voice deeper than mine and said, hey, uh, Mr. Robinson, I'm a, friend, I'm a fan of yours. I, I want to do what you do for a living. Well, his name is Solomon Howard, and he sings at the Metropolitan Opera pretty regularly right now. But I, we joined at the hip at that moment, and I said, look, give me a call whenever. You know, I mentored him. He gave me phone calls. He sent me emails. We spent time together. He came to my recitals. We broke bread. We talked about this. We talked about that. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting with my manager in San Francisco and got a call where she says, they just heard some kid in the chorus audition who sounds like a baby you. And I was like, was it Solomon? She's like, how do you know? But he's sticking with the plan and guiding him through the process. He's singing up to Matt right now. And there's several young singers that I do that for, and two, I'm not bragging, but I think it takes that amount, that amount of interaction. Uh, the results on the higher institutional level are, 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 um, are impressive. You know, as a, with my job at Cincinnati Opera, I've been reaching out to the community for years. 
uh, this will be my second year of the contract, going into schools, going into universities, holding master classes, holding real talks. And it gives kids a chance to ask questions, you know, to find out whether or not this is really something they want to do. They ask about your journey. They ask about your daily life. They ask about all these things. And I can give it to them straight up, you know, from a perspective of I'm a brother who looks just like you and this is what I face. And you, you, will, you will have to see these things. You'll have to sidestep these things. You'll be really good at this thing. And blah, blah, you know, it, it gives them a clearer picture of, of direction, but it also effectively affects the audience base, you know, because when you're on TV and you're in the paper and you're on the news and they know that you're going to be on stage, people will gravitate towards that which they find familiar or curious. And because I look familiar, I've been in the church, I've played the drums at their church, we'd have this thing called the Opera Goes to Church, I interact, they all know Morris Robinson. So when I'm singing Porgy, Everyone's coming out to check it out because that's our dude. We know him. He ate cake with us at the reception after the concert. You know, so it it, it takes effort to make this thing work. Uh, reaching into our community because it's not something that we normally service. So normally, there's always a small sector of African Americans that love opera, but they're like the different ones. You know, but to to broaden that thing, I mean, I have guys from the barbershop. Yes, we, we're done and talk to the brothers at the barbershop on some regular stuff. We talking football, we talking basketball, we talking all this other stuff. Oh, and by the way, yo, I'm gonna be performing at this. What? For real? Yeah, dog. They come and check it out before you know it. We going next year, we getting tuxedos, we we written limos, I'm taking my girl, we're gonna have dinner. You know, it, it becomes like an annual thing, whether I'm on stage or not. So that you know it I'm not saying that Morris the great. I'm saying that one's ability to present a product on stage that is relate relatable across a wide variety of of cultures makes it available to a lot more people. You know, you can't just put one product on stage and expect to attract lots of people. So, yeah. That's a word right there. That's that's it right there. I, I, yeah. <laughs> is this what we're doing? <laughs> that's it. We snap when something is good because right. that's it right there. And that to me defines what sort of what, what community engagement looks like in some cases, right. you know? Um, and so, you know, I, I just, I, I sort of wonder, because, um, and you sort of led to this point, because we talk about, you know, what, it, what advice do you give to, to the artists? What advice do you give to organizations who want to pursue proper representation in opera? Not checkbox mm -hmm. that we talk about all the time, but, but proper representation in opera, like true, um, true representation. Okay. Um I'm going to veer off the topic just a tad bit. I'm going to stay in the topic, but veer off the course a little bit. Motivation to me is very important. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that, why are we trying to include? Are we losing our audience base because they're getting greater and dying off? Are we doing it because there are lots of government subsidies that say, if you show an effort to do this and check that box, we'll write you a big check. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, that's happening. Mm -hmm. But the sincere form of really having uh, an interest in being diverse comes from individuals that realize that this is a fallacy in our business and we need to correct it and right the ship. And then they're the ones that put out the real effort in doing so. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Again, you diversify the product that you put on stage you advertise this product that you're putting on stage as a diversified product, and then you sell it to a diversified audience. Will you lose some naysayers that don't want to see that? Sure. Do you want them in your opera house in the first place? Probably not. Because that's divisiveness. We start in Cincinnati, and I've talked about this with other companies. As you start to display and promote a diversified product, and I'm not just talking African-American, I'm talking Asian, Hispanic, white, black, green, orange, purple, whatever, three-headed, two-headed. If you're the best soprano at singing in touring dot, you're on stage and we're promoting it. If your hair is green, great. We got green hair fans that will come hear you if we put you on TV. So I'm talking whatever the case is. We have to now, you know, in the during the process of such, you have to also train your audience base, right? To say, yeah, it's opening night and you wear your tuxedos and your gowns and your furs, but you know, Ray Ray is coming with his girlfriend and he's from the barbershop, but he bought his ticket, but he may not have no tux. We need you to say, Ray, it's cool. We're so happy that you're here. Let me show you around. Let me buy you a drink. 
what we normally do is stand in line over here and blah, blah, blah. You'll hear some bells, and when those bells say it's time to get to your seat, that lady there will help you to your seat if you need to go to the restroom. But just being warm and inviting because, you know, we have to get out of the mindset that this is only an art form for the hierarchy and the aristocracy because I'm not from the hierarchy or the aristocracy, and I'm going to say it's in Italian flawlessly, and it's okay because I can't. And we have to train everyone to understand that, you know, diversity means diversifying every aspect of the business. And if you're serious about it, you're going to take those types of approaches, not just trying to check off your box so you can get your check, you know, and I think that that's important. So I look for that. When someone talks to me about, about diversity, I look for the motivation. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I think that's big. I think, I think Quo has something to say. I see that look on her face. Go ahead, Quo. You gotta speak. You gotta talk about it. And just, uh, and it's true. And you mentioned it kind of earlier when we started the conversation that it's it's important to have those different perspectives, those different experiences, those different lived experiences, backgrounds, also in administration, right? We spoke about it in our last episode that it's necessary everywhere, right? It's necessary on stage, it's necessary in the pit, it's necessary in the audience, it's necessary in the casting room, it's necessary, you know, in our dressing room, all of this, it's necessary in every <clears throat> aspect. And in doing so, when we commit to doing it and doing it in the way that it's sincere, that it's sustainable, right? Once we get to the point where we realize that so much of our world can include so many other wonderful ideas and wonderfully innovative ways to go about sharing this art form with others, once we realize that, then, you know, there'll be very few things that will stop us from being able to go and reach out to someone who does not look like us or who does look like us and then say, hey, let's try this, right? We break out those Areas. We remove those boxes of, I expect you to do this. I expect you to look like this. I expect you to only be capable of these things. And so you speak on it. Speak on it more. It's like, because. Well, <laughs> you know, we bring our life experiences to the stage, you know. Right. So, you know, my life experience is going to be different than somebody else's and yours is going to be different than mine and, right. and hers. And But, you know, the, the more the that you bring to the stage and you also bring new interpretations and ideas, like you said, right. that's the stage, that's the, the, uh, the, the, the people that hire the singers, artistic box, that's the, the pit, that's the orchestra and the conductor, that's the director, which we ain't got no directors. Um, you know, all these ideas and things are coming with, with, with fresh thoughts or different angles or different experiences. And you bring all that to the table and the art form flourishes. I mean, it can only flourish because of such, you know? So I think that's important. Yeah, having different perspectives in the room when trying to breathe life into a 400 year old art form, I would think would be the thing that you would want, particularly if you want it to be sustainable. And so I am 100% I'm with that, particularly because this is the way the world looks. And you have to get with the, get, get with the times because it's the way the world looks. But even last week, we even broke it down to the, to the simplest thing. It's the, it's, it's the right thing to do. And it's past time, you know, it's past time, but it's still, it's, there is still time to do this. There's still time yeah. to invest in this and there are people that are doing it. So that brings me to, we, we have already covered why it matters. You know, we have already mm -hmm. recovered why it matters because we've talked about any way from an educational perspective, a mentoring perspective, business perspective. We talked about all those things down to the moral, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, people will say, this is, this sounds daunting. You know, this is a, this is a problem that's been long going on, you know, how on earth can we get this accomplished? And um, I've had people say that to me, even in the, the work that I've done, they say, you know, how, how, how are we supposed to do this? So much, so, much of, so much wrong, basically, so much wrong practice has been going on for so long. How on earth did we come back this? And, you know, Cole and I would think it's important to have positive notes about this type of work and this type of uh, approach and, and in, this, in, this, uh, in this business. I'm aware that there are people doing the work, you know, and I find that to be a positive thing. So what are some of the positive things that you, that you, that you see, Morris? It, it, the positive scenes and the positive things I see in making this right. Yes. The journey. The journey. Exactly back to what we just talked about. Uh, an influx of 
different views and influx of different ideas and influx of different personalities and artistic uh, capabilities, you know, uh, a, really an influx in the, the communal aspect of being a colleague. You know, um, I sang Zoroastro at the Metropolitan Opera one year where the Zoroastro was a brother from Atlanta, Georgia. The soprano was a sister from Alabama. The tenor, no, a white girl from Alabama. The tenor was a Jamaican dude from Miami. And the baritone was like from Russia. And I stood on stage at that moment and thought, how in the world did we all get here? You know, everyone brought their own stuff to the table. But we, at the end of the day, we were singing Mozart and we were singing it beautifully. You know, uh, I've been in way more diverse casts and I've been in some, di in some casts where everyone was kind of bringing the same thing to the table. I think that the communal aspect of it is important, but I think also that the communal aspect and drawing into the theater will be very beneficial. I've seen the results of that. I think that it's great. You know, uh, totally off the subject, but uh, my dad used to come watch my son play baseball uh, here in Tyrone, Georgia, and I would be on the road singing probably in Dallas. In fact, I was in Dallas one year, flew back for his game, didn't tell nobody, but I didn't get fired. So... But he would sit next to a guy that was contemporaneous with him. My dad is 76 now, 75. And this is five or six years ago. And it was an older white guy I would sit with him. And uh, my dad didn't come to the game because I was coming to the game. He wanted me to have that moment. So I sat with this guy. And he says, you know, where's your dad? And I was like, well, he's doing X, Y, Z. He says, you know, your dad and I, we, we really get along. He says, 20 years ago, I would have never thought that could happen. He says, I almost died of a heart attack like five years ago, but I think the good Lord let me live long enough to experience this. Because, you know, where your dad grew up and where I grew up, we're only 10, 15 miles apart as a crow fly. So this guy and my dad lived in Atlanta during a time where they didn't cross each other's paths. And it was decidedly so that it was not a good idea for my dad to be on his side of town. It definitely wasn't a good idea for him to be on my side. But he says, I grew up with all these ideologies of what I thought it would be like until I sat next to the man and we're both watching our grandkids play ball together. He says, I learned more about my life and more about the things that I didn't know about just sitting here. So tell your dad, I said, hello, and I'm missing him. I can't wait for him to get back here and talk. And I'm sitting there like, wow, that's a moment. It almost brought tears to my eyes because, you know, I grew up in a, an era just after that, but you know, there's so many lessons. So there's a lesson in that, you know, in that story alone that relates back to our opera world in so many different ways. How's that so? Well, opera as itself already stands out as something that people look as daunting or unfamiliar or for the other people until they actually get there and experience it. Mm -hmm. I've had like straight dudes like from the hood be like, yo, I didn't know opera was that dope. Yeah, it's dope, you know. And then you listen to them describe the libretto, like they really pay attention to it. And they know like, you know, I was watching, uh, uh, some friends were watching Butterfly one day, and it was like, yo, old girl, stupid. I can't believe she waited that, that long. And her homegirl was trying to tell her, but she, it was like, opera comes to the hood. But it, it, their perspective, it was articulate, it was very accurate, and they got it, and it was relatable. So there's that part. But there's also the community part of the, of the, of the, the audience base. You know, people go to football games and baseball games because they enjoy being with each other. And for three hours, the doctor can sit next to the trash man, can sit next to the deacon, can sit next to the dentist, can sit next to, you know, the guy that, the wino. But they're all cheering for the same team because they love that. And I think that we'll have that same type of communal aspect in the opera world if we're all looking at it and we're getting something out of it and we're loving it and we're discussing the story or we're moved by the music. You know, I think that it, it grows that way. And I think that that story relates to this. And there's so many other lessons that we can get from that. Um, but it takes the intestinal fortitude of someone stepping forward and saying we're going to make a concerted effort a real effort to make sure that the product that we present on stage is representative of the demographic in which we live and we serve once we diversify and realize that that synergy takes place then we become more like the football game the basketball game the baseball game we create synergy we create community that appreciates our art form mm -hmm. because they have something on stage that they can relate to but they also relate to each other in the audience because it represents more so our society than just one demographic showing up to watch another singular demographic. So I think it's it's beautiful that it can go that way if we can make it the, if we can make it that way. So absolutely, that's fantastic. Absolutely. So I think that that's um, the positive things that we can see that we see coming. And of course, I know you always have positive notes as well. 
um, just from your perspective in the work that you do. So what are some of the positive things that you're, you're seeing? I would say the, some of the positive things I'm seeing is the desire for this change, right? There is a desire for this. There is curiosity for this. And then there are people looking at it and truly wondering why things are the way they are. And I think <coughs> we get into a point or into a state of reflection, we have the opportunity to leverage that and take it as a chance to do something different, to change. And then I would also say that we're in opera, right? We're in an extremely creative art form. We are capable of creating creative solutions. We are capable of being innovative. We are capable of bringing people together because that's what opera does. It brings all these art forms together. There's no reason why I cannot bring a bunch of people together from different cultures, from different backgrounds, um, from different lifestyles. So keep that in mind as we do our work, right? Lean into that innovation, lean into that discomfort, but then lean into that community and know that others are doing the work with you, as we say all the time. Do the work and then know that you don't have to do the work alone. Right. Well, it sounds to me like that's a call to action. Um, we always have one at the end and we always seem to, to, to be able to, to wrap up around something of that nature. So I wanna thank Morris for being here with us today. Um, you know, Morris, you're just such a fantastic person. Um, I've known you for a long time, and I've seen the heart and the passion that you bring to the stage and off the stage into the community. And I think that it is a fantastic example of what can happen when somebody has a community mindset and then turns around and actually goes and does something mm -hmm. about that. So represent representation, diversity, EDI is in good hands as long as people like you are out there helping in this in this effort and doing the work. I think it's a fantastic thing. And not only that, you just, I mean, just, you're the baddest face walking. So I just, <laughs> you know what? I have to I have to do my fangirl thing. You know, the, the contralto in me very much respects the, the base Hello. in you. So <laughs> I understand that. Um, so thank you so much for, for being with us today. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure, and um, we thank everybody for tuning in. Quote, thank you always, a fabulous co-host that you are. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, TDO Network. Thank you, Dallas Opera, for letting us have this platform. And as always, we appreciate you joining us on Taking the Stage with Christian and... Quote. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.